Thank you, Yo. If my wife was here, she would say, who's that guy? <laughs> it's true. Uh, I just want to clarify, um, my company is not a millennium village. Huh? I just wanted you guys to. <laughs> and secondly, I've got real issues with the organizers for this conference because why isn't Stuart Pepper in here? I mean, when the guy said he has $280 million to spend, I had a warm liquid going down my leg, you know, I was like... <laughs> and, it, and I'm here about to explain my model, and he's nowhere to be seen. <laughs> I should have done the morning session, Bill. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here um, from Uganda. I, I came in on Sunday, and I brought you some nice African sun, right? That's why you've had a great week. Bill, thank you for, for, for giving this platform to an African entrepreneur. You know, these meetings are seldom addressed uh, by people in business, uh, key actors in the marketplace. I think it's very important when, you know, people say that the private sector is the engine for growth, and we rarely hear from, from the private sector. So it's a, it's a real honor and privilege to be here. Today I'm going to share with you a little bit about my company. I'm going to share with you a little bit about our vision uh, to bring coffees to the global market and to use trade as opposed to handouts to transform our farmers and their communities. I will expound on our entrepreneurial model that we created in 2004, uh, the journey that we've walked along in trying to achieve our vision and some of the lessons and challenges that we've faced along the way. And I'm hoping that by the time I'm done, you'll appreciate, like I do, that the only way you can bring about sustainable economic growth and development uh, is not through handouts and charity and sympathy. It's through hard work, it's through creativity, it's through innovation, and it's by creating that environment where entrepreneurship flourishes. The same thing that happened in this country. So I always wonder why, when it comes to Africa, do we have a whole different set of solutions? Why is it dependent on people's sympathy, on charity, on philanthropy? Uh, you don't really hear people talking about models for entrepreneurship and, and models that will bring about uh, business solutions to these big problems. So, in the beginning, I would just like to say as a background that we operate in the agriculture sector in Uganda, where over 70% of the population earn a living. The agriculture sector has been shown to be the most significant uh, sector to bring about real sustainable transformation, but it's also the most neglected. It's neglected by governments, it's neglected by capital. In Uganda, for example, only 4% of the national budget goes towards the agriculture sector, 4%. And out of the total loans that are available in the country, only 3.8% goes into the agriculture sector. And as a recent study showed by Calestas Juma, you know, the number of people who've gone hungry in the agriculture sector has grown from, 200 and, from 150 million in 1990 to 239 million in 2010. You know, this is a sector that's teeming with entrepreneurs, it's teeming with people with creative ideas, but they don't have access to markets for their products, they don't have capital to become the engine of their growth. And yet, agriculture has been proven to be two to four times more effective in reducing poverty than other sectors. The Malawian example, where in 2005, they had a national food deficit of 43%. In 2007, they had a surplus of 53%. I just want to put up a model at the back there, just to show you the kind of social entrepreneurial model that we began with in 2004. As you can see, I'll just use the microphone. Is there a microphone here so that I can turn around? If I could just have a microphone so I could speak to... In 2004, we went to Western Uganda. Thank you. In 2004, we went to Western Uganda. <laughs> I 
In 2004, <laughs> that's how I speak when I'm meeting the British supermarkets. My name is Andrew Rugasira. 2004, <laughs> went to Western Uganda. And we began to build um, the foundation for this. Now, the first thing we identified was a rural community. And there's a slight difference with how we look at the rural community to how maybe the Millennium Village people look at the rural community. We don't look at them as a bunch of guys who have a need, okay? And, and we come in and, and we have a solution to that need. So we don't use words like need assessment. You know, we don't, we don't use words like establishing what inputs they might need uh, in their situation. We look at them as people who have significant social capital. They have land, they have labor, and they have knowledge. They've been growing these crops, they've been producing them, so they have basic knowledge. So what we decided to do in terms of interventions was what could enhance the capital that's already existent there. And one of the things we thought we needed to do was knowledge transfer. So yes, they were growing coffee, but how could they up their yields? How could they up their yields and how could they up their quality that the price they would receive in the end would be better than the price they were receiving now? So we trained trainers. We put farmers into groups. We created demonstration gardens and we trained trainers. And the trainers would then go back and train the rest of the farmers. We also established that technology would also help not just their yields, but the quality of their outputs. So we not only advised them, but we gave them some pilot technologies, hand palpers for their coffee. We realized that one of the biggest issues was, as entrepreneurial as they were, and as productive as they could be, they didn't have the institutional frameworks to kind of pull their resources together and capabilities together uh, to bring about greater production and, and take advantage of, of bigger markets. So what we did was we created these producer groups, and each producer group had 50 farmers. In that producer group, they elected their leadership. They had a male and, and female trainer who would train the rest of the group. Then we also created uh, savings and credit corps, and this would allow the farmers to pull their resources together and lend each other. Because one of the biggest problems we established was a lot of these farmers were, were being held hostage by lawn sharks. And you know, you think urban lawn sharks are bad, you should see how the rural lawn sharks work. You know, they would come to the farm, they would estimate the crop value that the farmer has. So if it is $1,000 or let's say $500 worth of coffee, they say this coffee is worth $50 or $100. The farmer has no information or knowledge to estimate that correctly, and he mortgages his shamba for consumption money. So one of the things we advised them to do was, if they pulled their resources together, we never gave them a cent. We didn't put any single shilling or dollar into those savings and credit corps. We said that they were the solution to their problem. And what we encourage them to believe is that they're not only the solution to their problem, but if they pull their resources together, then as small and seemingly poor farmers, as a group, they would have serious potential. They would have capital, and they would have opportunities to create transformation in their communities. Now, when we did all this, we immediately began to see some quick and straightforward transformations. You know, one, they, the, the quality of coffee improved, the yield increased, uh, they were interested in conservation and environmental standards, and we helped them get certification. But they did all the knowledge transfer within their own communities, they took up the training themselves with enthusiasm and passed it on to other farmers across the Renzori Mountains, which is where we operate. They managed the producer groups themselves, and something really extraordinary began to happen. You know, the values that we don't really hear in a lot of these development reports began to manifest. You know, entrepreneurship, business exposure, the whole issue of dignity and esteem, the pride in producing a product that they knew was going into a market and they were receiving a good price and they could put their children in school, good schools and get good health care. That became such an important catalyst. And, and, and this is an underrated and... I think, under-debated issue, because the thing that stimulates 
uh, what we found in our experience, the, these, these producer communities, is not just capital, but actually the capacity and the feeling that they can actually do something for themselves. And this is what really we found was very motivational. We got better quality, we got better prices, we got financial literacy growth in the area, and also we just found improvements in the social uh, economic situation. Now, there are several models that have been developed. A lot of you buy ethical coffees, you buy fair trade coffees, and there are several models out there that purport to bring about transformation in the communities. The one thing that America has taught many of us, the Western uh, industrialized countries, uh, the Southeast Asian uh, tigers and economies, and really the North, and North Atlantic countries that have developed is no one is going to come and define how you should develop. Yeah. No one is going to come and offer you the models or the solutions to your problems. No one did it for you in America. No one did it for the Japanese. No one is doing it for the Chinese. And no one is going to do it for the Africans. It's a fallacy that someone can come from outside and offer a package. That's why we spend so much meetings and conferences and, and papers and position papers of what is working or what's not working, because these interventions are from without. What needs to happen is partnerships built on respect and dignity. Africa working with multinational partnerships, bringing about solutions to some of these intractable problems. Now, we found that the, rural, the approach to the rural economy is as important as the capital that's invested. Um, Stuart said something which really bothered me. He said, the problem we have is we don't have that many entrepreneurs. That's absolute nonsense. Because on the other hand, we say, oh, these are farmers that live on $1 a day. I mean, how many of you guys could live on $1 a day? I mean, can you imagine the entrepreneurship and the kind of innovation and creativity it takes to live on such minimal income? It takes much more creativity than living in New York City on a million dollars a year. I'm sure it does. Because, I mean, people still have needs. They still have aspirations. They have families. They have children. They have dreams. People think that the rural economy doesn't have people who dream. When we ask them, what are the things that you wish for in their focus group discussion, they say, better education for our children. They don't need schools just for the sake of schools. They need good quality schools. That's why sometimes we have challenges with free primary education in the rural areas because people know those schools are not the best schools. They aspire for schools where they can pay school fees and get better quality education. So they shun those free schools. When you give them free health care, they say, well, that free health care doesn't work for us because sometimes the drugs are not there, sometimes the quality is expired, etc., etc. They have aspirations. And if we treat them like entrepreneurs, people with dignity, self-respect, and aspiring for the same things that in our own different cultures we would aspire to, then I think the relationship would be built in a different foundation. And we might find that we might have a different set of results. Now, look, we're a small company. The CV sounds uh, really exaggerated because we're really a small company that just tried to embark uh, on a pilot and a test to see whether Africans working together could bring quality coffee to the global market. And if people buy that coffee, the farmer's livelihood would improve and we could make a profit. And what we found when we started in 2004 to 2012, and I'm sorry, this is not a randomized, uh, what do you guys call it? <laughs> randomized uh, control trial. I apologize. Uh, it's not as complex or detailed as that. And I've already offered uh, a colleague uh, an opportunity to come and uh, test some of these uh, clusters in Uganda. Um, the purchases of coffee when we went in in 2004 were 7,000 kilos. You know, the, the price in the market was about 43 cents per kilo. You know, the prices that we paid were $1.25. Why did we pay a higher price than in a market? We wanted to motivate quality. So we said, if you bring quality coffee, we buy it at a higher price. The farmers receiving agronomy training and in producer groups were about 2,000. Those who were certified, zero. The savings and credit cooperatives at the time, zero. The export markets we had at that time were just South Africa. We had one coffee shop, our sales revenue was $82,000, 
and we were roasting and packing our coffee in South Africa, and my wife kept saying, what the hell have you got us into, Andrew? <laughs> in 2011, um, over the last seven years, we've built the productive capacity of the farmers, and in 2011, they supplied a total of 430,000 kilos, which is about 430 tons. Now, the local prices have gone up. That's a global uh, issue. Uh, and we paid $4.25. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting granular on this because I think seldom do we have an opportunity to actually you know, get to the ground level of some of these entrepreneurial initiatives. So I think it's just important for us to appreciate that. Today, we have 14,000 households. You know, 14,000 households, you know, a turnover of $1.1 million. You know, I once wrote to an NGO here in the U.S. and said, if you just give me $2 million, I could get you 150,000 farmers. Because it's not actually about the capital, because a lot of that stuff goes in air tickets and reports and big cars and stuff like that. But actually, it's just a few things that you need to catalyze that will motivate communities to partner with one another and to get together with one another and to see through some of these initiatives. It's not us. You know, we can catalyze. It's not Good African that has gone and created 14,000 farmers. All Good African did was share the opportunity and say, you can do this. I shared my own journey as a student in England. I shared my own journey as studying economics. I shared my own journey as never seeing African products on the shelf. I shared my own journey about the difficulty of breaking into those supermarkets. But I said, we could do this. And some of those things are difficult to quantify for development economists, difficult to quantify for policy people, difficult to quantify for people with charity. There's something about huge amounts of capital blinding you and making you less humble to actually listen and see what actually works on the ground. So today, we roast this coffee in Uganda, and we're exporting a finished product from Uganda to the United Kingdom and to the US. Now, what are the lessons? What have we learned along the way? The one thing I learned is never to believe when the World Bank says export-led growth is a solution to African development. Bill, I mean, that is, I think, the biggest conceptual fallacy uh, that's not built on any substance and, and interventions that need to happen for this to become true. It's one thing to say conceptually, export-led growth will develop these economies. It's another thing to recognize the real challenges in getting exports from Africa into the global marketplace. You have serious non-tariff barriers. You know, it took me 14 trips, 14 trips with this accent and this tie. You know, you know and I sit there and I speak, I don't fidget, you know, I'm steady, I'm speaking to the buyer, I'm saying we have good coffee from Uganda, Idi Amin died a long time ago, you know, <laughs> don't believe the last king of Scotland. But believe me, to, to wipe away, you know, all that pollution, you know, that things like the last king of Scotland and even worse, Corny 2012. <laughs> you know, guys, you know, it's, it's one thing to be well-intentioned. It's another thing to be misguided. And when you're misguided and you portray a complex issue in such simple terms and you create this impression that Connie has been in Uganda today. Connie has not been in Uganda for four or five years. He's not been in Uganda for four or five years. The debate and the dispute is not whether he's uh, taken in child soldiers. That's not the debate, but the impression you give. So when guys come like us from behind with products to market, the buyers we find, that's all they have. They have Connie 12 on their mind. And they're thinking, am I really going to buy this product from this guy? who comes from this country where Kony is rampaging in the north and has got 30,000 child soldiers. I mean, the issue could have some truth, but it's much more complex than that. You know, never mind that the video 
erodes the dignity of the people that the video purports to be wanting to help. These helpless, <laughs> these helpless Ugandans. I mean, there's a part, and part of me sympathizes with good intentions, but the other part says, look, there needs to be more wisdom with these things. You know, you have this young man and, you know, on this fatalistic rant about kill me. You know, in my culture, or, you know, for someone to just say, oh, I think you better kill me. Five years after the fact, when he lost his brother. If he said, look, five years ago, when my family was killed, I felt like I just wanted to die. You could have killed me then. But five years later, before our camera, and this guy is saying, kill me? I mean, what does that trigger in people? It triggers one thing here, and people raise money, and that's fine. And, and every celebrity jumps on. And by the way, I, I welcome any celebrity endorsement. If any of you guys are, <laughs> I really do. I was telling Bill, we need to change the narrative, man. I need to go. I think good African needs to go some route like that. <laughs> um, but, but. If, if, if you undermine the dignity and, and you posit this, this thing where generous and kind Westerners uh, come to the rescue uh, of, of, of these Ugandans, I mean, you're really simplifying what is a very, very complex internal issue. And, 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 and so it's sad. But, but lastly, and I, I, I'm talking about this because this is an issue everyone I meet asks me when they get to know that I'm from Uganda. Look. Connie had become irrelevant. Right now, he's the most relevant thing out there. You know, for 100 million people to see this guy, he has just been elevated to the level and given publicity that he never had. So, who knows what that will do? Who knows what motivation that will give? This guy was an extinguished tyrant, you know? So, the issue of how we portray Issues, the perception issues is, is a very critical issue. The other issue is the issue of access to capital. Access to capital for entrepreneurs in Uganda and most of Africa is one of the biggest constraints to entrepreneurship. I think the World Bank Group uh, wrote a financial access report in 2010 that said that out of a thousand people who are looking for capital, looking to access credit, only 28 of them were able to access that credit. This is in sub-Saharan Africa. And you put that within a kind of aid-dependent environment where you have a lot of aid coming in, and because of the distorting capability of that aid coming in, you have the central bank in Uganda, for example, doing what is known by economists as sterilization. So they sterilize these foreign currencies that come into the country. And how do they sterilize them? By inviting people and institutions to buy uh, monetary instruments like treasury bills and government bonds. That is to counter the inflationary impact of, of the shillings that they need to produce in exchange of these foreign currencies that come into the country. So what happens is a lot of commercial banks then buy up these government bonds sucking out capital that would be available for the private sector. And in Uganda today, you find that 63% of these treasury bills and government bonds are owned by the commercial banks. They hold the largest portfolios of these government monetary instruments. So, I think that we have a pilot here that stands for encouragement, that stands for people renewing their faith in the private sector. The guys don't have to look like you, they don't have to be dressed like you, but they have ambitions and they have aspirations that are just similar to you. That's one thing I have found. An entrepreneur in China, in New York City, in Kampala, in the Renzori Mountains, has the same thing. They want good education for their children, they want good education for themselves, they want good health care, they want better housing, they want better mode of transportation. They want all sorts of things that we all want. So what is the constraint that's stopping us? I think it's a mental infrastructure issue. It is an issue which allows us just to humble ourselves and say, if these guys want the same things that we want, if I'm a businessman, I want markets, I want customers. So if they want markets and they want customers, how can we facilitate that? How can we create markets? How can we create customers? How can we provide capital? 
if a lot of this $80 million that the Soros Foundation has put into the Millennium Villages had been put into a, a social entrepreneurial venture capital fund, I think we'd be talking about a whole host of different results than we've been debating this morning. And I'll just end with an example of what can happen. The US is the largest coffee market. I'm sorry, I've got to end on a biased note uh, as a coffee producer. And this, this, uh, this is the most important part of the speech. You know, keep this data in your mind. 400 million cups of coffee are consumed every day in the United States. 400 million cups. 150 million consumers. A $28 billion industry. If Africa, that produces 12% of the world's coffee production, gained 12% of the US market, it would equate to almost $4 billion, which is over half of USAID in financial year 2011. The key and the power is in your markets, not in your kind hearts and the handouts. That's great, and I'm big on charity. But I think the key to serious solutions are going to have to be based on business and are going to have to be based on trade and not aid. I thank you for listening to me.